nice to be here. I have 20 minutes to tell you a 40-year story. Uh, it's my autobiography. And it grew out of a personal experience I had as an inner-city kid uh, flunking out of public school. And I happened to walk by the art room door one day. And the art teacher was a ceramic artist. His name was Frank Ross. We had a potter's wheel. And he happened to make a great big old bowl. I was blown away by that. I was standing at the art room door, and he said, can I help you? I said, yeah, what is that, man? He said, well, that's ceramics. I said, I want you to teach me how to do that. And he said, well, get your homeroom teacher to sign a piece of paper that says you can come here, and you're good to go. So for the remaining two years of high school, I cut all of my classes, um, and I went to the art room. But I was smart enough to give the teachers whose classes I was cutting the pottery I made, and they gave me passing grades, and that's how I got out of all over high school. Uh, <laughs> And, <laughs> and Frank Russ said, you're too smart to die. I don't want it on my conscience. I'm leaving the school, and I'm taking you with me. I'm not going to let you die like your buddies in the streets. So he insisted I fill out a college application, which I did in pencil, mainly to get him off my back. And I put it in an envelope, and I sent it to the University of Pittsburgh. And I got this letter back. It says, you've got to pass the scholastic aptitude test to get in here. Well, I'd never seen the scholastic aptitude test. I marked it up with multiple choice. I flunked the test. I got into the university as a probationary student. Well, I'm very pleased to tell you I graduated with honors, and now I'm a trustee of that university. Um, <laughs> and I got up in front of 13,000 people as the commencement speaker and said, don't give up on the poor kids. They might end up being the commencement speaker. <laughs> and that story is what I'm going to talk about for a few minutes. People are born into the world as assets not liabilities. It's all in the way that you treat people that drive behavior. And if Mr. Ross had not figured out that in spite of my grades, I had something to contribute to the world, I'm another black guy that's dead or in the penitentiary, like a lot of my buddies who didn't meet Mr. Ross. So I've devoted my life to this story. So I built a training center in my neighborhood. My whole 66 years is six city blocks. I was born in that neighborhood. I'm going to die in that neighborhood. And part of the message is I want the kids to know you don't have to go to the world. You can bring the world to your neighborhood. And so he took me to see a very famous house called Falling Water done by a very famous architect named Frank Lloyd Wright. I'm 16 years old. I see this fabulous house sitting up on the boulder. It has a creek running right through the middle of the house. And I looked at that and I said, in my neighborhood, we're trying to keep the water out of the house. <laughs> this guy's got a creek running right down to the middle of the place. That's an interesting way of looking at water. The other thing that fascinated me was the light that enveloped the house. I said, if I can get that light into my neighborhood, I'm halfway home. So I committed myself to building a Frank Lloyd Wright building before I left the plane. I did, I'm gonna show it to you. I hired one of his students to build that. This is my concept of what a school for poor people is supposed to look like. It happens to be in the highest crime rate It's in the highest crime rate neighborhood, which is my neighborhood. We have no metal detector, and no security cameras. And in 27 years, in the highest crime rate neighborhood in Pittsburgh, not one incident of violence, drugs, alcohol, or theft. That's the entrance to the building. We have fabulous artwork. Everywhere in your eye turns in this building is something beautiful looking back at you. That's quite deliberate. The worst part about being poor is what it does to your spirit. Poor people never have a nice day. They've forgotten that the sun comes up in the morning. So the concept is if you want to look like somebody who's got an answer, you have to look like the answer and not the question. So I put this center here to look just like that. It's flooded with sunlight, even on a gray day. Why? Because you got to get people out of the dark and put them in the sun and let them know that the sun's for everybody on the planet, not just rich kids. This is at Christmas time. This is how a school's supposed to look. The whole idea is to celebrate life, particularly for people who don't think they deserve one. And the reason I won the so-called MacArthur Genius Award, I figured out the cure for spiritual cancer. It's called sunlight and food and art and values. You put that together, you can cure cancer of the spirit every day of the week.
That's our boardroom. I commissioned the Japanese cabinet maker to do 60 pieces of furniture for our school. Hired the guy from Kyoto, Japan. And we spun him off into his own business now. But we got 60 pieces out of it for our school, mainly because the children deserve to go to a place where there's handcrafted furniture that greets them every day. I, I hope y'all uh, like Heinz ketchup. I don't know where your politics is about ketchup, but I stand with ketchup. Um, <laughs> In the old days, before I got real sophisticated, I had a cardboard box built in my school and I was trying to raise money. I got called into the office of United States Senator John Hines, who was the heir to the Hines ketchup fortune, which was like going to see the Wizard of Oz, because <laughs> he had about $600 million and I had about 60 cents. He said, man, you've done a great job with the black folks and the inner city people. We understand you want to build a new school. I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, you could really help the Hines Company's affirmative action goals out if they had a culinary program, a new school, and you get it built, we could hire some black folks and solve the problem. Well, back then, Bidwell was a building trades program. I said, Senator, I'm really reluctant to go into a field I don't know anything about, but I promise you, man, give me the money, we'll build a school, I'll come back in a couple years and we'll get that culinary program going just like you asked. And he sat real quietly, he said, well, what would your answer be if I said I'd give you a million dollars? I said, Senator, it appears that we're going into the food training business. And, uh, <laughs> John did give me a million dollars, and what we built was a gourmet kitchen for poor people. And I trained people for the food industry big time. Now, we lost John to a plane accident. I believe that he would have been handing the keys to President-elect Obama in the White House, but he didn't make it. But God is my witness. When y'all come to Pittsburgh, you'll feel his spirit at the front door of that building as sure as I'm standing at this podium. That's what we built for the students in the amphitheater. That's our pastry department. This is lunch at the school every day. Why? Because it's difficult to teach people when they're hungry. So the answer is give them something to eat, but we don't do fast food, we do gourmet food. And every student every day has a gourmet lunch. Good for the stomachs, better for the heads. I wanted to take the stigma out of food. Good food for everybody on the planet, not just rich kids. And if people tell you that you can't serve poor kids gourmet food, send them to Pittsburgh. I've been doing it for 26 years. <laughs> These are presentations done by poor people. That's lunch. That's dessert. I always like to do this presentation right before lunch. <laughs> That's one of our guys. That's Chef Keith. He teaches production cooking. That's our dining room. Reminds you of your high school cafeteria in your hometown, right? Yeah. What's where students eat? We also train pharmaceutical techs for the pharmacy industry. These guys. You come to Pittsburgh, I'll show you poor people doing pharmaceutical applications with no background in science, 10 months after enrollment in the program, and they all go to work for the pharmacy industry. So the takeaway is, the only thing wrong with poor people is they don't have any money, which happens to be a curable condition. It's all in the way you think about people. This guy was on unemployment last year. He's now working as a research chemist for the Water Treatment Authority, making about $50,000 a year. There is nothing wrong with people who are born with deprivation except the opportunity to do something about it. And that's why we built the center. Those are chemical equations behind those women because many of them are working now for Bayer and Calgon Carbon doing uh, chemical applications every day of the week with logarithmic calculators. So we now know that poor people can do advanced technology and they can do it in less than 12 months in the middle of the inner city of Pittsburgh. That's met electronic medical records. That's our library. Unfortunately, I have people with high school diplomas that they can't read in the library. We're gonna lose this country, folks. We are losing this country. If you've got 50% dropout rates for the minority kids and the kids graduating from the school can't read the diplomas you gave them, our chances of survival are increasingly diminishing. But we can solve this problem. I've been doing it for 40 years. You have to build an environment that celebrates life and not death, and you can solve the literacy problem. This is the arts program. Remember, I'm the, I'm the black guy from the 60s making pottery in the streets? Well, I started Manchester Craftsman's Guild in a row house. I lived in a sleeping bag, started dragging kids in off the street, saving their souls with clay. 
And I started hearing back from the school system the kids were starting to show up more regularly. After a couple years, I figured it out. There wasn't anything wrong with the kids. The school system was the problem. What the kids needed was sunlight and food and clay and somebody to believe in them, and you could solve this problem. Last year, we graduated 97% of the kids. In a school system with 50% dropout rate. So the headline is, you enroll kids in a world-class after-school arts program, you can double the effective graduation rate in 36 months in any neighborhood in this country. So we do clay. This kid's going to Penn State. His brother's already there. He came through the program as well. This is kids' work. These are all the kids that supposedly have no talent, remember. Artistic aptitude is not a requirement to get in the program. What we're interested in is whether there's still a little bit of a flame left inside these children. If we can get them to come, we can make that flame into a bonfire. Five of my faculty are former kids who went through the program and are back teaching at the center that saved their life. This is a piece the kids did with Sana Musasama, who's one of the great African-American mosaic artists in the world. Look at that young man's eyes. That tells you the story. When I go to a school, I look at the children's eyes. Most of them are looking out the window. They're not looking at the blackboard or a book. This child is engaged in saving his own life. Look at this man's eyes. This is in the middle of the inner city where supposedly no hope exists. We do photography. The kid who took that picture is working for Walt Disney Studios. This is the gallery where the student artwork is displayed. This is our concept of how to display the artwork of inner city children. We have a formal food presentation, smoked salmon at the art openings, museum quality invitation. I even got their parents coming. 15 years ago, we couldn't buy a parent. The, teacher, the kids would work, they'd break their backs, they'd have these fabulous shows, and none of the parents would show up. So the kids started tearing up, and I got tired of watching that. So one of my buddies got, us, got into saving souls for Jesus, you know, dragging guys out of bars with a Bible and all that kind of stuff. I said, I want you to come work for me. You got to tone down the Jesus stuff, but keep the enthusiasm, man. Uh, I can't get the parents to come. He said, I'll get them to come. So he took the van, went to Miss Jones, decided, Miss Jones, I knew you wanted to come to your art, kids' art opening, but you probably didn't have a ride. So I came to give you a ride. Well, we did 20 parents and 30 parents. The last show, 300 parents, and we didn't pick up one parent. Why? Because now it's not cool not to show up and support your kids at the Manchester Craftsman's Guild, or people think you're a lousy parent. The guy on the left is the director of the photography program. He started in seventh grade with us. We believe in our product. This is actually an old slide. Before I got real fancy with my PowerPoint, I actually had slides in a box with duct tape on the corner. You remember those things? Well, I actually had one. And I got in invited to a place called the Silicon Valley. So I showed up with my slide projector, and these people looked at me like I was from Pluto, man. <laughs> but that's cool. I blew off the dust, plugged in a little slide projector told my story. The lady came out of the audience, she said, man, what a presentation. My only criticism is your computers are getting a little bit old. Well, I ain't no high tech guy. They all look about the same to me. I said, well, what do you do for a living? She said, oh, I help run a company called Hewlett Packard. I said, well, my dear, there's an instantaneous solution to this problem. <laughs> and we ended up with a, close to a million dollars in technology and a systems engineer to go with it. And we now have one of the hippest digital imaging centers east of the Mississippi River and I'm putting kids into Pratt and Rhode Island School of Design right out of the Imaging Center. But I keep this slide in here for nostalgia reasons, and you never know when an Apple representative might be in the audience. <laughs> <laughs> this is called a classroom. This is how you're supposed to treat your children. Oh, I also built a music hall. I'm very glad I did, because a trumpet player named Dizzy Gillespie showed up. I said, why'd you come to this place? He said, Billy Taylor told me a black guy built this center, and I didn't believe one C for myself. And you ought to build one of these things in every city in this country, and I'm going to help you do it. So he allowed us to record his concert. He gave us the rights to the music. And then Herbie Hancock showed up, and then Winton showed up, and Nancy Wilson, and Shirley Horn, and Betty Carter, and the Basie Band, and Paquita De Rivera. And those are the children who come over to listen to jazz. Look at their faces. Those children are alive which means you can teach them something. 
and jazz is part of the cure for cancer of the spirit. These are the kids. Here's Dizzy. Pat Matheny. Oh, we, we won, uh, we've won five Grammys for our recording, so we have our own record label. MCG Jazz is the hot young digital recording studio in America, in a black neighborhood with a high crime rate, but not in my center. There's the recording studio. That's the audience on opening night. If you'd have dropped a bomb in that room, you'd have wiped out all the rich people in Pennsylvania, because they were all sitting there, <laughs> including my mother and father on the left-hand side. They're both dead now, but they long, long enough to see the kid build a center in the neighborhood and open it up black tie. The next night, I had the neighborhood come in. Same food, same music. I wanted to establish the principle that you don't have to own a tuxedo to be treated with dignity. And I knew people would start talking about that. This was burned out during the riots. I had to look at that going to my fancy building, so I had another box built. I built that. That's a medical technology building. So our center now owns a medical technology building where we do training, and the thing actually makes money for the school. University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. There's the bank. And I also built a greenhouse. And what we do in the greenhouse is we take welfare moms and single parents, and we have them grow on those, orchids, which we sell in the grocery stores to generate money to support the center. Because everything I showed you today is free. It's tuition free. We raise the money so we can provide a world education to people who don't have a chance. We're also doing that. And we're, those are the orchids, by the way, we're growing. And we're now growing hydrangeas, and we're now growing poinsettias. We did a deal with the zoo. We split the proceeds. And this is at the Home and Garden Show. And now I'm down to the end of the presentation. I only got three minutes, so I'll, I'll move it along. But here's the point. I was doing this slide presentation in the Silicon Valley. This young man came out of the audience and said, man, what a story. I said, cool, man, what are you into? He said, oh, I built a company called eBay. I said, oh, great, man. You got a card? Remember, I ain't the techie guy. So I put the kid's card in my pocket, went back to Pittsburgh, and asked one of the little techie kids. I said, man, have you ever heard of something called eBay? He said, yeah, Mr. Strickland, that's the Electronic Commerce Network. I said, holy smokes, I met the guy that built the company. So I called him up. I said, Mr. Skull, I've come to have a much deeper appreciation of who you are, man. <laughs> and he started laughing. He said, I thought you'd figure it out sooner or later. Uh, here's a half a million dollars. I said, what's that for? He says, your first replication. I think Dizzy was right. I think you can scale this idea. And so we're building centers, guys. We don't own them. I don't want to own them. It's not McDonald's. These are standalone centers, but we're all affiliated with each other. These guys are open. There's the space in Frisco before it was fixed up. There's Mr. Skull on the right, the kids doing digital imaging with Billy Wong. These are the kids. Oh, by the way, every space we build is beautiful or we won't build it. This is Cincinnati. Cut the dropout rate to 6% in 24 months, and I don't live in Cincinnati. I live in Pittsburgh. It's the environment. The environment drives outcomes. There's the building. There's the gallery. Some of the kids. Digital imaging. They turned this into a business doing murals around Cincinnati. This is the one we opened up in Grand Rapids. It looks just like that. Those are photographs of Dr. King taken during the last two years of his life. There's the dining facility for the kids. Western Michigan Center, there's the gallery. There are the children, some of the graduates. These folks used to be on welfare. They're not on welfare, they're pharmaceutical technicians. Welfare is a state of mind and, and, and not just an economic condition. These guys are fine, they can feed their kids, no problems, case closed. This is the one we opened in Cleveland. These are the kids, we saw kids get off the bus and walked away from the center because they thought they got off at the wrong stop. They couldn't conceive that something this beautiful was for them. Well, that's how upside down this conversation has gotten in this country. This has got to stop. There are the guys. There's the recording program, first medical group going through. This is the one we just opened up in New Haven. It looks just like that. <laughs> this is the one we opened up in Boston two weeks ago. This is the med tech program. This is the first rural program, rural white folks. Learning from a black guy from the inner city of Pittsburgh, which means that Dr. King's spirit is alive and well.
Um, I've got five seconds, so give me 30 seconds. I'll finish this. These are centers that are now being planned. We open Buffalo up next month. Richmond, Charlotte, St. Croix, Vancouver, Atlanta, Chicago, and Sharon. These are cities we're talking to in the U.S. about building these centers. And these are the first two international ones. I have Jews and Arabs meeting in Israel right now to talk about building a center for the kids. Why? Because hope is the cure for terrorism. It's also the cure for cancer of the spirit. And I'm trying to get a bill passed and I have a book out called Make the Impossible Possible. It tells this whole story. I'm going to sign a few books after the presentation. Please come join me and allow you to let me tell you why I'm here. Because a guy named Kirill Sokolov, a very wealthy man who saw me, and he read my book, and he said, I believe that the spirit of life is in you. And I'm going to help you. And I would like you to come to this conference to tell people this story. Now, here's my message to you guys. I think you're the good guys. I think that people who came to a place like this for this conference are the good guys. Something in you drove you to come here and listen to these wonderful artists and extraordinary speakers who are trying to advocate life in the midst of great sorrow. And because of your sensitivity, you must suffer very deeply because of the way that you're built. You probably feel pain and human suffering at a much higher level than the average citizen because you're affected so deeply by the arts, which oftentimes drives creative people. And you must get lonely from time to time. But I came here to let you know that you and I are not lonely. We have each other. And the ultimate gift that you can give someone, which is what you're giving me, is your respect and your affection. And for that, I thank you very much.